Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Miss Womack, Mr. Shaw here, ready to blow minds again. Chapter six. Let's do it. Okay, we will be going through these learning objectives. We will. 6.1 through 6.3. That'll be your quiz next week. Do I need to read them? Huh. Identify demographic okay. trends and their likely impact on American politics. Explain how the agents of socialization influence the development of political attitudes. And describe public opinion research and modern methods of polling. Uh, we'll get to these guys next time. All right, so first one, identify demographic trends and their likely impact on American politics. These are the things we're going to cover. We're going to kind of talk about everything that makes up what is known as the American people uh, and just really a lot of the things that influence Americans in general. Okay, so as Americans, um, as the United States, we are a nation of immigrants, right? Right. Okay, one million legal immigrants per year, 500,000 illegal. Um, about 13% of the American population is foreign-born. Interesting. Um, and that's increasing. Like, yes, very much. Um, and then the next portion kind of goes through these different waves of immigrations. And um, I've kind of added at the end what time period each of those um, happened in. So from Northwest Europe, we have the early to the mid-1800s. Southern and Eastern Europe would be late 1800s, early 1900s. And then Hispanics start around the 1960s. Um, and we still have large waves of those coming in today. And that, like, this is like, part, like, you don't really need to know the different waves, but it's important to know kind of that this is something that we're still dealing with. Immigration yes. is always, since the United States has always been kind of accepting of all peoples, uh, it's something that, you know, I mean, there's some people that think we shouldn't be accepting of all peoples anymore. Yeah. And so the immigrants in general really have a tough, uh, a, you know, a tough go in society, right? Especially nowadays, just because there's a lot of hostility uh, towards immigration in general. So we and, and kind of getting into that, we talk about America as a melting pot because, you know, people come here from all over the world and they want to stay. They want to be a part of the they want to live the American dream and they all truly do become Americans. Uh, the the first really important instance to know about this, uh, at least how we deal with it now, is called the minority majority. So I believe it's by the year 2050. Mm -hmm. So by 2050, there will be what's known as a minority majority in the United States, which means that the white population will now be the minority. Now, that doesn't mean that any one minority will be uh, bigger than the white, the white population, but all the minorities together will make up a larger group than whites. So that is what that, that says. Again, America will eventually cease to have a non-Hispanic white majority. And that will be a very interesting day because whites control a lot of society still, even today. And so we're going to really see a, a big shift um, in, in culture, probably, and um, within the next 30 years, mm -hmm. and, and politics, too. Uh, and we'll see if old white men like to hold on to their power. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. We know that. I'll be, I'll be an old white man by that time. So It'll maybe, I don't know. It, we'll see what I do. It'll be you. Uh, so the other thing that we, we know, you guys know that African Americans obviously descended from reluctant immigrants. Uh, they were forced to come here uh, as slaves. And there are, there's a really difficult, uh, like situation of poverty that they still deal with. About 24% of African Americans are still in poverty, which is compared to 9% of non-Hispanic whites. We, historically speaking, we know that, that a lot of that is because of the post-Reconstruction uh, America, things like Jim Crow laws, uh, things like white flight that we talked about in American history with, you know, the whites moving out to the suburbs, taking all their money with them. And the political power of African Americans is definitely still increasing, but it still is pretty lacking, uh, especially in certain areas. The, again, the next thing is the Simpson-Mazzoli Act of 1986. Uh, I don't know that you necessarily need to know this. No. Um, this is an attempt to actually curb illegal immigration. Uh, it says that employers must document the citizenship of their employees. Unfortunately, though, it is really easy to get around that. And because of that, a lot of a lot of places are they will like like send. Basically, it's like okay, if you receive receive a false social security card, uh, how do you really know that it's false? Yeah, we don't like, know. There's really good ways of of kind of counterfeiting those sorts of things, and so it's really difficult to prosecute employers who are accepting of illegal immigrants because it's really easy to fake documents. So the Simpson-Mazzoli Act was very ineffective uh, at doing what it had had intended to accomplish, which was curbing the 
the use of illegal immigrants as labor, um, in, cheap, labor. In, in, cheap labor. So uh, political culture and assimilation, now that's what, what's interesting too, is that a lot of people, there's people on both sides. There are people who are worried that uh, immigrants come into the country and they don't actually assimilate to American culture. Uh, and because again, America has a very well established political culture, but some people are worried that that's changing too rapidly and that immigrants kind of have too much of an influence on on the political culture. But again, what we what, what a lot of us you know know is that the experiences that other people bring uh, usually lead to a much more diverse society, which yeah. is going to you know have a lot of benefits as well. Hmm. So this is kind of showing you the the coming minority majority. So you see here that the white popu white meaning non Hispanic population is decreasing. Okay, are they becoming a per a lower percentage of the U.S. population? And then right about Oh, well, actually, log. Okay, so 20, yeah. 20, 30, 20, 30, 20, 40 in that area mm -hmm. is when it'll actually take place. Yeah. Uh, so we're, I was a, a few decades off. No big deal. Yeah, um, but again, you notice here that you see the Hispanic population is in, increasing. It's actually the fastest growing um, in America. Native Americans stay in, stay in pretty low at, at 1% or 2%. Asian American is increasing a lot, and African American has kind of gone up a little bit, but uh, not increasing as fast as the others. Uh, Asian Americans are actually really uh, one really interesting group because they have higher uh, high, like the highest percentage of college degrees among any of uh, any other immigrant groups. That's correct. So they're, like, some people will sometimes call them like super immigrants because they – I just made I just made that up. Super. I just I just made that up. But um, <laughs> they, I, they will because again they they are they are a low percentage of the population, but they are bringing a lot of people with really good skills. Innovations. Yes. Okay. Um, into our country. All right. Um, now we talk about the regional shift. So um, for years, obviously, um, we had a more populous east. East Coast, and then as we start spreading westward, people are you know moving out there. Um, Northeast um, was the most populous area for many, many years. Um, since about World War II, though, we see the West and the South growing much more rapidly now than any other parts of the country. Um, especially, I think, like Texas, they've really increased their population in the last 20 or so years. Um, and so we see this demographic change associated with this political change. So as demographics in each of these areas change, po politics in those areas are also going to change. Um, so you can kind of keep in mind, you know, the idea that on the coast we have more liberal um, individuals. In the middle of the country we have more conservative individuals. And so region and shift of populace also kind of takes into consideration how people vote. Okay. Um, and then we need to talk about reapportionment. And we've already covered this um, a couple units ago. Um, but we know that every 10 years or so, um, the government sends out a census. And that's how we get each state's population. Um, and then from that census, states can either gain or lose representatives, um, depending on if they gained or lost um, population. And so going back to the example of Texas, in the last census in 2010, Texas actually gained four seats in the House of Representatives because of how many, um, how much their population increased. So the the weird thing about this is, and again, this is really important with the Hispanic population that is growing. Yeah. Most, a lot of Hispanics, this is a generalization, but most Hispanics are, are, at least the ones that are coming into the country, are going to vote Democratic or vote, right. they're going to be more liberal. Uh, they're going to want the government to do more for them. Uh, and make sure too that we talk about the de like the demography. You need to know what that word is. Demography. demography is the study of population in general and like population shifts, changes, things like that. Uh, so you need to know that. You need to know the main way to measure that is the census that takes place every ten, 10 years. years. Uh, and should we give them the the court case from the past? Or make them sweat. I think I'm going to make, make you sweat. We're going to make you sweat because it's on the next quiz. Okay. Again, remember that we've talked to – there was one we, – we talked about uh, two cases that deal with uh, reapportionment. Um, and really just in general, they, we want the reapportionment to be fair. And one of them uh, was going to be on the quiz where you'll have to name it and then describe the decision. Find it. Sorry. The one, one dealing with reapportionment. That was really that was really intense. I apologize. It's okay. All right, Let so, me talk about it. Uh, so we also know that – the United States, I think the world population in general is very much grain. Several different factors go into this. And by grain, we mean that the biggest group of people 
are old. Silver foxes. Silver. So, okay, modern medicine is contributing to this. Lower birth rates are contributing to this, et cetera. Um, so people are living longer, which means that it's becoming a more imminent um, problem that Social Security may be drying up before we get to it. Um, so this is an implication uh, for Social Security, um, and we've talked about this before. We've talked about how that Social Security is a very important part of our country, right, for people, older individuals to be able to live. Um, and as we, you and I, get to that age, um, there are could potentially be major problems um, with collecting Social Security. But anyway, what do we mean by ratio changing? So the, ra the, the ratio... The population? So before, like in the 1960s, like 50s and 60s, the ratio of the number of people working... Yes, that's and right. ...and then the number of people pulling from re retirement yes. was 5 to 1. So for every person that retired, there was 5 people working that would uh, that would basically... They're, they're paying into retirement, and then that one person is benefiting, getting the benefits from Social Security. So remember that Social Security is mandatory spending. Right. Okay, you have to spend it, okay? Nice vocabulary. You know, thank you. I've, been, I've been practicing. Um, so you have to spend that money. And like that's the problem is that the ratio is now two to one. Right. So now there's only two, two. people paying into Social Security for every retiree because there's so many retirees. Again, the, 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 the baby boom okay, that happened in the 50s right after World War II, okay, the, the, the uh, birth rate shot up. And we haven't seen birth rates that high since the 50s. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the, the problem is that we're spending more and more money. And we have to spend it because yeah. they these people have been paying into Social Security in. their entire lives. And if we don't give it to them, well, they'll have nothing, essentially. Like right. I, people, especially people that don't, didn't like do any sort of saving otherwise. Right. That if, you, if you didn't plan for retirement and you were relying on your Social Security, which it's not much. Like it's not yeah, like, it's not like you're not going to be able to buy a yacht on Social Security. But it is going to be a, a sum that it's will keep you out of poverty. To, yeah, it's it's a set amount that allows you to live your life um, like mirroring how you lived before you retired. Yeah, just making yeah, sure you're not living in amount. squalor. Like, right. So anyway, this is a really politically sensitive topic. Um, both sides of the political spectrum have um, – very harsh opinions or very, you know, powerful opinions on um, this. And I don't know if I need to I get mean, into it. I don't know. I mean, yeah. de Democrats are usually in favor of it. Right. Republicans are usually against it. Right. Uh, but again, that that goes over to big government, though. I yes. feel like yeah. Demo Democrats love big government. They want the government doing more. Republicans want the small. government small. Yep. Deregulate. Next. Ooh. All right. 6.2. Explain how the agents of socialization influence the development of political attitudes. All right, so we're going to talk about the process of political social socialization, what it is, and then how you guys become socialized politically over your lifetime. So there are three main agents of political socializ socialization. So the idea of, for, I guess we should kind of define it first. Yeah, like the idea political of, socialization. if you don't, you should probably write this down because I don't know. Let me check real quick. We don't really have it. Um, you need the definition of political socialization. Check it out in the book if you need to. Otherwise, what it means is that you it's the process of you getting your I ideas and your beliefs about politics. Okay, you're kind of you're you're not only are you getting the uh, like the American values and the American uh, like core beliefs, but you're also getting the uh, like the political side of it too. Yeah. So you're. Again, and there's three main ways that you learn this. The first one is the family, okay? And the reason, and I, like, if you if you look at your beliefs, and if your beliefs are the same as your parents' beliefs, that's because your parents have always been talking about, uh, you know, the, the the things that they believe. They probably never sat you down and were like, um, you want a big government, okay? You need yeah. to believe in this. Like, more but, likely, they were probably talking about taking care of people. And right. they're saying it's the government's job to make sure that the people are cared for. The, or, these are, you know, if you have a particular church affiliation and then, you know, you go to church with your family and then some churches get very involved in political issues. Mm -hmm. And so you could be learning um, some of your political ideas from church. And that's, and I think that, that like, that's so important to, to realize that the... If you want to know how somebody's going to vote, almost always, a large majority of the time, you can look, look at, at how their religion. parents vote. Oh. oh, sorry. Look at how their parents voted. And their religion. And their religion, too. Both. Both. Okay. But also parents. But we're not even... 
Well, I'm sorry. I'm I'm grouping religion with family. That's fine. You you can. That's fine. Sorry. We're gonna fight later. The mass media. <laughs> anyway, the the mass media, unfortunately, and you guys know this. Like this is no, not a, the new this parent. Is, this is not really new to you. It's the idea that people are like there's there's less parents at home. Okay, specifically because both parents have to work. Or the idea that kids are spending much more time watching TV, okay, or being exposed, not necessarily TV, but like being exposed to social media, things like that, looking at the internet, rather than talking to their parents and spending time with their family. Mm -hmm. So the media is now becoming a new agent of political so socialization. Yes. And it is, um, I, I don't know, I don't know that it necessarily does a good job. No, I, d I like, don't think it does. Well, and that's part of the problem is that like, like, since the beginning of American culture, younger people have really not participated in politics because you know that it doesn't really affect you as much. And that's why older people do because there's things like Social Security and they want to they want to make sure to protect those programs. So there's not as much of a value for, for young people to participate in politics, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't. You actually should. Please vote. Um, that was is, is what I was talking about the age gap. The last thing is school. Again, the the school the school's purpose is to help produce good citizens. So that's why it says forming civic virtue. The idea is really a simple one. It, the more educated you are, the more likely you are to vote. Okay, the more likely you are to have better knowledge about politics and to be uh, tolerant of opposing political opinions. That's my favorite one. If you see somebody that's really angry or that can't tolerate your opinion, it is most likely because they are uneducated. I added that in on purpose. I know you at did. The bottom. Thank you. That's just for me. Um, again, that's that's so important, guys, because it, the more educated you are, you understand that this is not just a one size fits all sort of situation. You understand that there's no right answer. They there are just certain beliefs that people have about what the right thing to do should be at any given time. So when people can't stand you because of your political beliefs, <laughs> okay, that is more of a, a, a more of a sign of their weakness. Weakness. I love that. That's good. I, I can't. Sorry. Uh, rather than your, it's not your problem. You should get better friends. Oh. Write that down. All right. No. <laughs> did, <laughs> all right. Political learning over a lifetime. So we just kind of talked about how um, political participation definitely increases with age. So the older individuals get, the more likely they are to vote or even participate in politics in general. Although I will say that as of late, I feel like there has been a major wave of younger individuals getting involved in regards to like protesting and marching um, and stuff like that. And Ob I know during the Obama administration too, I feel like he was yes. he really he was like really a called did arms a good for young job people. of, of yeah. bringing young people into politics. I feel like Trump did it in the same way, but or uh, he, he did, did the same thing, but with, in but a, a different, different way. Group of people, yeah. Like young, young young Republicans young people, were, were coming right, but out in a different way. Yeah. I agree. Um, and so, as you get older, your party identification really strengthens. Um, we definitely, you know, you might know where you fall on the political spectrum right now as a teenager, but um, I can almost guarantee in ten years that's going to be even stronger. Um, or at least that's in most cases. Um, and political behavior is learned. So y you do get your identification from your parents, from what, maybe it's church or from school or wherever it might be. But you also learn a lot along the way. Um, and you learn that being involved and voting and voicing your opinion um, is something that is really important as an American. And it's important because we have these values um, and these rights that we can do things because there's a lot of countries in the world that don't allow you to do that. I thought it was interesting too. The book mentioned something about like doing a twin study, and yes. they so they looked at the like the political leanings of twins fraternal that were, for so fraternal twins and then identical twins. And the the study showed that the identical twins voted together yep. more so than the fraternal twins. Uh, who so I think the fratern it was something about being raised in different environments. So when you would think they're kind of taking the environment out of the picture and even when that was the case when you're like oh well in a different environment they're going to vote differently mm -hmm. and they did and the, the identical twins did not yeah. and they still voted together which made people kind of lead to the get to the conclusion that genetics actually does play a pretty big role in politics which right. i thought was interesting i didn't never i didn't I never thought of it that way yeah okay so this chart just kind of shows us um different age groups and um, turnout, voter turnout, um, as it correlates to the different age groups. So obviously, if you guys look at the first section, it's 18 to 20 year olds, and it's very, very low. That's really 
like surprisingly low. Not surprisingly, but it's kind of sad. Um, and then look, 65 to 74, way up there. So, you know, if you guys want to have your voice, you need to go out when you're 18 and vote every chance you get. I have a question. Sure. Why, Miss Womack, does mm -hmm. 85 plus go down, do you think? Maybe because people d die. Die? Maybe because people die. 85 is pretty old. But why would that wouldn't mean they wouldn't be included in the chart if they died? Because there's voter turnout. But what I mean is 85 plus, there's not a lot of people that are that old. So voter turnout's going to be low for the age group of 85 or older. I was just thinking that they couldn't get there. Like, no, they're dead. They're not dead. You wouldn't include them if yes, they were 85. Yes, you would. People 85 and older. You would not, it's a low turnout. You would not include them if they were dead. They're not a, they're not a registered voter so if they're dead. So this is of the overall population. Yes. Okay, well, I'm not that far off. <laughs> I was going to for Yeah, it's probably like, really hard not, for them to get out and vote. Whatever. That, yeah. They're also dead. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Next. Okay, uh, so this is kind of going to be the main main part of the of the this whole section here, uh, talking about public opinion research and modern methods of polling. Uh, we'll get through this um, and then we'll call it a day. Yeah. So we're going to start with how polls are conducted. Uh, let's get into it right now. So the main thing to take away from this how polls are conducted is we are obsessed with public opinion. Okay? Then, and by we, I mean just Americans in general, politicians, everybody. They, we want to know what other people think. Well, the government like really puts a lot of emphasis on how does the how do the American people react to the, what we just did, and then we poll that reaction, and then if it's a good reaction, our government will continue to do that, or if not, they'll change what they're doing. Correct. Like we really just put a lot of emphasis on the perception of things. True. And it came around in the 40s. Harry Truman was the first president to have to deal with this. Oh, Missouri. And I know you like that. Mm -hmm. um, so a poll is just a questionnaire. Okay? You guys probably know what a poll is. It's a questionnaire that's designed to, to determine how you feel about a certain subject. Now, it would be very it would be very expensive to ask every single American what they believed about a certain subject. So, I mean, there's 300 million Americans. So what instead they're going to do is they're going to ask a just a, a sample, a, a small sample size, uh, in this case, a small portion of people chosen in a survey that are representative of the whole. And they're going to choose them randomly. The reason they do that is because if you didn't choose them randomly, okay, you're not going to get accurate data. So theoretically, if if African Americans made up nine percent of the uh, of the, oh, the of the overall wrong. population, thank you. The then in the sample that you get, you should have nine percent of African Americans, and so on and so forth, and like fifty percent of women, things like that. And you and the, if you do that, yours. Uh, your sample size is going to be valid and you're going to be able to get good data. So the and, and they know that there always there's always going to be inaccuracies with polling and that's what kind of it's a big criticism of polling. Um, so that's what's called sampling error. And this is the level of confidence in the, the findings. Uh, the more people are, are that are polled, usually the more confidence in the results. So what you'll see, the sampling error will be like plus or minus mm -hmm. two or three points or four points. So if they only, if we only ask like 50 people okay, what they believe, the sampling error is going to be huge. But if we ask 10,000 people what they think, the sampling error would be very low. Well, uh, the I don't know if random digit dial. I don't think that's a very big deal for you. Um, the it's literally the idea that they, they're just going to dial random numbers on a cell phone or not on a cell phone on telephones um, to in order to get as as good a data as they can and to keep that random sampling valid. That has become very difficult with mm -hmm. cell phones because they're the government is actually or the courts actually have ruled that you cannot um randomly dial cell phones. I don't know why they made that distinction. I guess it's but some kind of personal I don't know. Cuz your book does address the cell phone versus the landline issue and it is like people are more likely to answer their answer polls if it's through their landline than their cell phone. I don't know. Maybe we're just more skeptical if somebody's calling us on our cell phone. I don't know. I don't know. I don't I don't ever really answer. No, if I don't know the number, I'm not answering it's like, leave, it. Leave a message. I'll call you back. Right. Um, also, people – so we, we've moved into what's known as internet polling, uh, which is actually shown to be – people are more willing to answer polls um, when it's in an email or when it's online because it's not as invasive. Again, when you're on the phone with somebody, it mm -hmm. like, it like you have to stop everything you're doing pretty much and talk to them for 10 minutes or however long it takes. Whereas if it's on the internet, you can just click through real quick, um, say what you want, send it back, and it's a lot cheaper. 
Yeah, and it's not like you just go to a website and like just fill in a bunch of polls or you can do it a bunch of times. It is actually a company that's going to email you or something like in regard something like that. But they'll email you a questionnaire. Maybe it's like something like a Google form where you just pick options A, B, C, or D or whatever, something like that. Um, but it's not like you can go to like a website and, and answer the same thing over and over and right. over again. Like the random sampling is really probably the most important part about this whole right. slide because that's what's going to give you good data. So like even if like let's say Fox News does a does a poll, they have to make sure that their samples are random so that they can – they're not going to only poll Fox News viewers because that's going to be very skewed data towards conservatives. Same thing with like MSNBC. They can't just – poll their listeners or their watchers because that is going to give them skewed data. So they have to randomly sample to make sure that they're getting that good data. Okay. The role of polls in American democracy. Um, we know that polling is a tool for democracy. Um, it gives, you know, people, I guess you could say it gives people a voice. You know, it gives our uh, politicians kind of a direction to go in. Um, but there are pros and cons to both. Um, so it is a great way to gauge the public opinion, um, especially when it comes to major elections, right? So these politicians kind of need to know how people feel about them and their opponents and, you know, what they're doing wrong or right or whatever it might be. Um, that is a pro. We consider that definitely a positive thing. Um, however, some people see polling as a way for politicians to be like followers rather than leaders. So um, depending on how the public perceives a certain policy that the politician, all P's, um, has announced or come up with or whatever it might be, um, it can be a con because we're kind of seeing that politician not necessarily change the policy, but maybe change how he presents the policy to the public people. Well, and it's it's too like we we need our politicians to make tough choices. Yes. And like you're not going to be happy with every you're not going to make everybody happy. Like they're they're the book mentions something about like how uh, Thomas Jefferson might not have done the Louisiana purchase if he had been right. able to pull the people and to see, hey, are you okay with spending taxpayer money on uh, on you know uninhabited land? Like if you had had phrased a poll like that, most Americans at the time would be like, no, no. thanks. No. Hey, but we again that was a big part, a huge like a part of American history. But it might not have happened if Thomas Jefferson was worried about what the public thought. Right. So we want our we want our politicians to lead us and to create policy regardless of, you know, if half of the population doesn't agree, if they think that that's what's right for the country, that's what we want them to do. Sure. Um, um, so moving on. Another type of poll is something called an exit poll. And these are um, basically as people go in and vote, there will be people who are working for polling companies that kind of wait for you um, outside of the polling place. And they're going to ask you how you voted um, or maybe, you know, who you voted for, whatever it might be. Um, and these are very widely criticized. Um, they sure. only like act like they ask like every one in ten people, right? Like they're and not so, asking everybody, just every like one in ten. So there's, there's still a lot like of sampling. flaws involved, and a lot of people say that people still aren't going to tell you th they're not going to be truthful with who you voted for. If they think you're going to judge them, they're going to say they voted for someone else, or they won't answer it at all, or whatever it might be. Um, so some argue that. If they're if people are going to be asked right after they leave the polling place who they voted for, it's going to actually discourage them to even go in and vote. Well, even that too, like if you think about the time zones, like if you do, right. like if if all of the information it from the uh, eastern and central time zone is in, and they are saying, uh, you know, this person has won won the election. Right, candidate A is way ahead of candidate B. Right. Well, then people on the west coast, like California, might not even go in and vote because they're thinking, well, my candidate's already lost or won. I don't even need to go. Um, and right. vote for them. So that kind of covers that first uh, bullet too. Um, and then there's the problem of wording the questions. And these can be very, very, um, this is a very sensitive because you can easily be biased in how you word questions or how you ask the questions. Um, and so an example that your book gives talks about um, when President Obama was rolling out his Obamacare legislation um, and people were asked how they felt about it, 
overwhelmingly people would have negative answers um, if they were asked about Obamacare. But if they were asked um, about the Affordable Care Act, which we know is the exact same thing, just a different name, they were overwhelmingly very positive. Their actions were very positive to Affordable Care Act. And so just how those two things are worded could have affected the polls. Um, and so a lot of, um, you know, these pollsters, it takes a lot of time to come up with questions and aren't going to be biased. And I think that just that last part goes into why this is such a big problem in American society today is that a lot of people have no idea what's happening. Your book mentions something about like if that like 70 percent of people were able to mention like name oh, all name all three of the Stooges, like Mo, Larry, and Curly. But uh, it was like 43 percent, 43 percent, only 43 percent could name the three branches of government. Like it was alarming, and so that kind of gets us into a whole it does, another issue about people uninformed. not right. People are so uninformed, and these people are are having just as much say in the election. Um, which I mean, I don't know. Is that, that why our founders created the electoral college? It very well might be. Well, they and did. that is it. They believe like, they believe that we weren't educated yeah, enough to Hamilton, make such a decision. Hamilton didn't think that people should be able to vote for president because they were too stupid. I mean, uh, he probably he probably wouldn't have said it that way, but yeah. Oh, hey, look at me oh, go! Look, so we were just jumping right <laughs> ahead of ourselves. So okay. sorry. So, so sorry. So um, again, Americans are uninformed. We know that. That's part of the reason why the voting rate is so low. A lot of if you ask people why they don't vote, they probably will tell you. Ah, I don't know. I don't pay I just, attention. I just have no idea what's going on. I don't feel informed enough to vote. Which you can change that. Yeah. Um, so again, Jeff Jefferson though had a really big faith in the people. He felt that the common people were were going to be able to do what was right. That they were going to be able to make the right decision um, more often than not. And again, we know that young people are the most un un uninformed, and that changes really right here. You know, 100 or 300 students at a time watching a video, learning about things. Anyway, the and, and like that's kind of the problem. There's a lot of a lot of blame gets put out about like who's responsible for all these people that are ill informed. Is it the school's fault? Is it the media's fault? Is it the parents' fault? I mean, what do you, I mean? We and we don't really have a good answer for you. There's a lot of other factors that are going on that lead you guys to I mean, I mean more of you than not rather to not care about politics. Um, and maybe it's not you guys. Maybe it's more just maybe it's other people in other classes that are, don't care as much because. I don't know for any number of reasons. I don't know. It's the you idea guys like really don't care. Some of you do. It's like, it's I a, didn't care as much. I cared a little. In I didn't. High I didn't really either. And I like, cared a lot the, in college. I started caring a lot more in college. The, it's like it's a, kind of the same reason why people are so afraid of somebody like Kim Kardashian running for president. And it's like the like, people are so uninformed that they would vote for her just because they recognize just her. Just because she's famous. Like, yeah. Like yeah. Oh, she's pretty. I'll vote Ooh. for her. Like that's and that's the kind of thing like that we're getting to now. Ooh. And like those are that's becoming much more of a problem. You mean like when a reality star becomes president? That could be an example. Oh. Oh, okay. So moving down. <sighs> anyway, um, so we have this big paradox of mass politics, and people are going to vote. Basically, uh, like most people only care about a few issues, so they are going to vote for the candidate that uh, that is going to going to vote in a way that on the issue that they care about. So if they are against abortion, they're going to vote for the Republican no matter what. And no matter what other policies that Republican might have, like if they had to choose between environmentalism or abortion, they like if the abortion was higher up, okay, and they're in their like belief, you know, belief system. system, they are going to go with the Republican, even though Republicans generally are are unfavorable to the environment. So that's kind of what we're dealing with here yeah. is that is there's a lot of things at stake and the kind of people being uninformed and just kind of focusing on one issue leads us to really not be able to make any good choices, unfortunately. Agreed. And I think that um, has the last, I don't know, 20, 25 years, it's become even a bigger divide on people literally just voting with the party instead of who they truly agree with or who their values align with the most, which candidate. It doesn't matter. We're going to vote party either one way or another. Right. And I think that you're seeing, like, I think that's why both parties are kind of trying to go with people who are more, like, yes. I would say, like, almost less experienced. Like, Obama yes. had very, very little experience. Yes. And very, I think he was, what, a, a freshman senator? He was. He was a senator, and then he became president. And, like, and Donald Trump had no political experience at all. And that's kind of, like, that's where a lot of the parties are going to because there's, oh, that probably gets into our last slide. is like We're about this, again. This, 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 like, horrible distrust in government, um, which is a, also a really bad problem. 
Is that the next one? Oh, okay. Um, oh, what? this just shows, um, sorry. It's okay. How education kind of, well, different, a bunch of different stuff. Education, age, race, gender, all that. How it uh, correlates to political knowledge. Political knowledge. So you so see. You, yeah, yeah, you can see at the top, the more education you have, the more knowledge you have on politics. Graduate degrees. Um, again, you see that it goes down sharply, especially with no high school diploma. There's we're less than uh, 35 percent of the question uh, of the questions answered correctly. Uh, age actually, like this one, is crazy too. You see, the older they are, the more experience they've had with politics. They're going to answer more. Um, and I, this is like this is crazy to me. White, then to go right, to the minorities. Right, because if you look at the race group, yeah, I mean, we just talked about how these minority groups are going to be, you know more there's gonna be more of them in the country in the years to come and they're so much less educated on politics um and that's a generalization but like that is the that is right the case sorry that is this. but on this no, graph but, that's what it's showing sure. and so um you know we want them if they're going to be the majority of people voting we want them to be the most educated and the other thing too is that african like minorities the like more often than not are more are more often in poverty right so when are you when you're in pro poverty you don't really tend to care about politi like politics yeah. that much because you're, you're so about busy. Everything else. Right, you're worried where your next paycheck's coming from. You're not worried about uh, who's going to be, you know, your your senator mm -hmm. for the next 6 years. And look, I like that on the conservative and liberal, it's like equal. Yeah, that's crazy. That okay, Mod moderates good. though. Dummies. Moderates, they don't know who you're, who they're going for. Now look and at this then, though. This oh. is crazy. So people, so this is in the 2012 election. So more people that voted for Romney, the Republican candidate, uh, they actually got more of the questions right by a small percentage. But yeah. still, that's interesting. Yeah. So then you might say that Republicans are a little bit more informed. I, I don't know. I don't yeah, know about that. I, I mean, I maybe. Know, based on the chart anyway. Right. 2012. All right. So this right. is the last part, as I mentioned. You want to take it? You go for sure. it. Sure. Decline of trust in government. So our government was very trustworthy, I guess you could say. People had m so much trust in our government up until... You could say about the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s, um, and a bunch of things happen that really um, lead the American population to break the trust with the government. First, the Vietnam War, um, and you can correlate that with the um, New York Times versus the United States, right, when the Pentagon Papers were released, and it shows that our government was kind of lying to us about what was going on in Vietnam. And so that kind of starts it, um, and we call it the Great Slide. And then Watergate with uh, President Richard Nixon happens. Um, and then in the late 70s, we have um, an economic issue, and we have an Iran hostage crisis that, was it Jimmy Carter? It was Jimmy it Carter. It was during Jimmy Carter's mm -hmm. presidency. Um, and so we have all these things that are kind of happening that are leading the American public to have less trust for the government. Um, and is public cynicism good? I don't know. So people tend to – this was a very interesting part of the book. So people – right, as as a society, we all pay taxes. And um, people have a lot of complaints about where the tax money is actually going. And so if you're someone who's paying taxes and that tax money, you know, goes to help the poor – or the less fortunate, or it helps people with food stamps, or whatever it might be, but you're not actually receiving those benefits. Um, people, some people tend to really have a negative uh, view about that whole process, and so that also kind of decreases our trust in our government. It's like I'm paying for people to do these things, you know, to live or whatever, and it's not. I'm not getting any benefit out of it, and so that leads me to be mad at the government. Well, and you're also worried that they're not. Using, using the it, funds appropriately right, right like it's it's not that the that the, the program is itself is bad but right. there might be bad people okay, who are abusing the abusing program the or program. things like yeah, that absolutely. even the politicians so right. um and what this leads to when people don't feel like that like that they're benefiting they're directly, getting any benefit like yeah, they're giving leads, stuff out but they're not getting anything back right. from it and that will lead to a lot of people not wanting to even have those kinds of programs right. because i mean they don't want to deal with the, like the normal average middle class people who are you know, not rich, but they're, they don't necessarily, they aren't receiving the same benefits as, as the people in poverty. Right. Okay. Ugh. Oh, here you go. So oh, the, declining trust in government. Perfect. So you check, you check this out again, you see like the, the purple line is when you, like they're asked, um, if they trust the government some of the time or if the government is doing the, the good, like 
yeah, if you trust them some of the time, most of the time or always. So always is the lowest one. You'll see that again, here's the great slide, okay, with the end of Vietnam and then Watergate here right at the beginning of the 70s. Uh, and then you see it, it's really never come back. Like the, it, like a little bit towards, we have see a little bit of an increase it's right here. It's after 2011, right? or 2001, Yeah, after 2001 with 9-11, there was a lot, like the people, there's a little bit more trust in the government that they were doing what was right. Uh, and you see that actually with most of the time. That's why this skyrockets here again, mm -hmm. is that in 2001. But again, most of the time, there's going to be like really just terrible like, like ups and downs all over the place. Uh, a lot of people don't know what to think. Uh, and, you know, you can really only make that judgment for yourself. Yeah. Is Guy, that it? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, guys. It's been fun. Catch you in the next one.